All right, scholars. So today we are going to engage in a primary source document. Um, and this primary source document is one of the most famous documents in American history. Uh, so what we're going to read today is the Emancipation Proclamation. And we're going to read it together as a class. And at the end, we're going to do a close, uh, a historical reading analysis of the text. All right, so can I get a volunteer to start us off? Go ahead, Ms. Brown. The Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. Bye. Skills that we like to highlight in historical reading. One of those is sourcing. All right, we have to make sure that what we're reading comes from a valid and reliable source. And we use questions to kind of figure out is this source reliable? Should we believe the information that we just read? All right. So the first question is, who wrote this document? Who wrote this document? I'm calling on a scholar with a raised hand. Go ahead, Jasmine. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. And who is Abraham Lincoln? And what kind of authority does he have? Go ahead, Oliver. He's the 16th president. 16th president of the United States, and as the president he has, he's also called what over the army? Commander-in-chief, Commander all right? So, he is more than qualified to write this military order, all right? He has the power to do so. All right, when was it written? When was it written, Heaven? January 1st, 1863. January 1st, 1863. All right, and we know that is in the middle of the Civil War. Why was it written? Scholar with a raised hand. Why was it written, Jacoby? Um, to free all the slaves in the rebellious states. To free slaves in rebellious states. And what's going to be the effect of freeing those slaves in rebellious states? What is it? What is it going to do to the South? Miss Brown. Very good. It's going to have a negative impact on their economy. Um, moving on to contextualization. All right, we use a lot of this in this course. All right, so using prior knowledge, what events serve as background information for this document? What are some events that happened um, directly before the Emancipation Proclamation? Righteous? The election of 1860. Very good. And that's arguably the beginning, the political beginning of the Civil War. What else? Civil War? Yes, we fought uh, various Civil War battles, including what significant battle that popped off the Civil War? Uh, Che? The Battle of Sumter. The Battle of Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter. Very good. The Battle of Fort Sumter. You want to add your cover? Uh, I, I thought um, John Brown had a big part to too. Okay. So John Brown's, John Brown's raid is going to have... Um, some, some impact as well. That's a good. That's a good background. Um, a background event as well. Um. All right. So, what were some of the current events that surrounded this document at the time of this drafting? What are some of the current events? How is the union doing in the war right now? How are they doing? They're losing. All right. So that's very current. Right around this. Right around this time. Yes. Are they losing because? Um, no, they're, they're really losing because the South has better leadership and they're fighting a lot of these battles on Southern lands, as well as uh, the morale of, southern, of the Southern troops is a lot higher than that of the Northern troops because they're fighting for what? Their way of life. Their way of life. Very good. They're fighting for their way of life. How they, what they feel is right. Their heritage. Their institution of slavery. All right, this is how we do things, and nobody's going to tell us how to live our life. So at this time, although they are out, they are outnumbered, they're going to have uh, a significant advantage at this point because their morale is higher. That their want to is a lot higher than that of the Union troops. All right. Um, so how might the circumstances, the fact that they're losing, um, affect what Abraham Lincoln wrote in this document? How might the fact that they're losing affect what Abraham Lincoln wrote in this document? What made what, what made him uh, want to write some of the things that he wrote? Um, Oliver, he probably meant like put like being very strict on the southern states because you know they're losing in the war, so like trying to buckle down on them and make them want to say never mind, we'll stop fighting. Okay, let me ask you another question. Why? Why would 
why would he want to um, not end slavery in those border states, though? Because, you know, he needs their support. Like, in order to win the war, he's going to need those border states to support the northern side. You know, they go to the south, and there's no way to win the war. Exactly. All right. So, first, the circumstance is they're losing. We got to do something. All right. We got to figure out a way to weaken the south. Secondly, we have to make sure that we continue to let these border states continue to have slavery. Because if we take away their right to slavery right now, they're more likely to join the South, and we're going to be at an even greater disadvantage. All right? So next thing in historical reading is cooperation. All right? What prior legislation could, contra could contrast this document? So what are some things that have happened prior to the Civil War, some uh, some pieces of legislation that would go directly against the Emancipation Proclamation? What are some past legislation before the Civil War that would go directly against the Emancipation Proclamation? Jacoby? The Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise? Okay. Thinking of another compromise. Uh, Denard. You want to pass it off? No, I was going to say the Kansas Nebraska Act. Right. Okay. The Compromise of 1850. Yes, the Compromise of 1850. Specifically, what part? The Fugitive Slave Act. All right. This document is going to go directly against the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act kept Northerners from interfering in, in, in slavery. All right. And this goes directly against that. Yes, Oliver. Um, what, is that? what was the Compromise of 1850? So the Compromise of 1850. Finally, uh, let's engage in close reading questions. Um, who is the author's audience? Who is he writing this to? Who is he writing this to? Uh, Southern states. All right. Is he, is he also writing this to Northern states as well? Yeah, he yeah. wants everybody to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. All right. He wants the South to know. You know, this is our next plan of action. Now we're we're going to move into the South and start liberating slaves. All right, and it's also going to let the North know about his plan of action as well and how he's going to try to win the war. All right. Um. So how does the document's language indicate the author's perspective? Uh, how how can you tell, like, in the tone of what he's writing, um, how he feels about the South having the institution of slavery. Based on what he's said in the document, what kind of tone do we think he has towards slavery in the South at this point? Go ahead, Jacob, take a stab at it. I think his tone is more like, since y'all didn't want to follow my, my leadership or they want to succeed from the union, I'm going to take something y'all love away. Exactly. Like, you don't care right now. So at one point, he tried to play nice. He tried to say, guys, let's just come back on into the union. Nobody has to fight. It doesn't have to be that big of a deal. And the South, they weren't trying to hear that. So now he really has to try to find a way to weaken them. All right? And this is, at this point, he's kind of had, um, he's kind of had the last straw. All right? So who are some people that will most likely disagree with his perspective? Logic. States in rebellion. All right, they're going to see this as something at first he cannot do because he's not their president, right? Because they have their own country at this point. All right, so they're going to really um, not be in favor of, of this idea. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to engage in some discussion. All right. And our compelling question for our discussion is, does Abraham Lincoln deserve the title of the Great Emancipator? So I know we have a lot of our own perspectives on this, 
But I want to take it back to 1863. All right? So we're going to do a little bit of role playing. And there are going to be some multiple, there are going to be multiple perspectives uh, on this issue. All right? So I want to divide the class up into six groups. All right? So um, from Miss Ray towards the door, you four are going to be black Southerners. All right? <laughs> They're white. You're going to be black Southerners. All right? <laughs> And from Miss Bowden to Ariana, you're going to be white Southerners. In the middle, you all are going to be uh, from Jacoby and Che forward. You all are going to be black border statesmen. And behind them, you all are going to be white border statesmen. Here, you all are going to be black Northerners. And in the back, you all are going to be white Northerners. All right. Now I'm going to give you two minutes to turn and talk and think about how people in your particular perspective are going to feel on this question. It's 1863. You're going to think about how people in your specific region and your identity markers are going to feel about this question. All right, two minutes, turn and talk, go. Okay, tracking up front. All right, how this conversation is going to go we're going to start with our uh, black Southerners, and then we're going to continue. Um, if you want to add on to something that they, that they have just said, you raise your hand, and you can add on to it. Now, if you disagree with what they say, thumbs down, and I'll call on you so you can uh, add your rebuttal. All right? Now, I'm not going to be in this conversation. This is going to be between you all. Y'all going to debate whether Abraham Lincoln deserves the title of the Great Emancipator. Black Southerners, what do you have to say? Ms. Brown, go ahead. Okay, so basically you Listen said up. that we're 50-50. We feel like he should be, but then we feel like we shouldn't because 50% of us are grateful that he freed us so everyone will be punished and no more have to, I mean, we won't be punished and no more have to go through that. But the other 50% of us said that we are a bit confused because we don't know how to read, write. We haven't survived on our own or actually been able to like provide for ourselves. So Jenny wanted to add. Well, she said everything, so. Uh, okay. I see I see some disagreements. Constance, what are uh, our border people yet? Uh, go ahead, Heaven. What demographic are you representing? I saw you have a thumbs down. What do you disagree with? Um, I'm representing the black bordermen, and I put a thumbs down because we feel like we the emancipation negatively impact us because our slaves were not free. They were not set free. Like some of them were free. We were still enslaved. Okay. Yeah. Somebody want to add on? I see some we other more to say. We gotta do it up. He's calling the whites. I'm gonna let uh, what are these white border states for here? Yes. yes. All right. Let me hear from you. All right. So we feel that. Hold on. Wait. Only rep a representative from the white border states is speaking. We have a civ we're having a civil debate. All right. So you you should wait your turn to um, insert into the conversation. Go ahead. Yes, I will give my respect. Go ahead. <laughs> um, so we believe that, I mean, I believe that the emancipation was great for you all. I mean, I'm glad you all felt that you all got so um, We are just kind of content. I mean, we're going to have our slave department. I'm glad that, you know, you all are pleased, however, I'm we're fine. Um, so we're so, good over here. Right, right, right. So answer our compelling question. Do you think Abraham Lincoln deserves the title of the Great Emancipator? I mean it don't matter, that's what you all want to call him. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wanna add on? 